Thank you all for joining us today at a wrap-up session of a series we have been conducting on climate change and vulnerable communities. In the course of this series, we uh, spoke uh, of problems and issues emerging as areas and nation states face climate change adaptation. Uh, we've looked at instances of the US coastline We've looked at circumstances of flooding in parts of Bangladesh. We've looked at the uh, hurricane intensity increase in uh, Dominica. Uh, we've talked about measuring adaptation and, and the problems inherent in that. And today we are very fortunate in order to wrap up this series with a discussion which will be a bit broader now, seeking to incorporate some of the earlier discussion and experiences in a way that will allow us to take some, uh, some broader lessons from, uh, from what we've learned. And I think that what we'd like to start talking about today is the question of migration and climate casualties and speaking in a broad sense about adaptation and the need for it, um, one does not have to really speak of more than the issue of climate migration, which is happening already, which we expect will become much worse in the decades to come. And uh, in fact, one of our guests was co-author of a very important report in 2018 by the World Bank assessing that there are going to be perhaps even billions of migrants and that and that they will be centered in much of the global south in many of the countries that are most vulnerable to climate change. Uh, the other thing that we've noticed around the world in the US with regard to forest fires and drought, as well as in many parts of the world which are, are more known for having uh, extended droughts such as the Sahel region in uh, Africa, parts of the Middle East, um, we've seen extensive flood damage in South Asia and East Asia. We've seen uh, entire nation states in danger of sinking in parts of the Pacific and the Caribbean. Uh, you know, these, these images are important to consider. Uh, and for example, damage suffered by um, Hurricane Maria in the island's country of Dominica in 2017 actually reached about 226% of the gross domestic product of that island nation. In other words, over two years worth of economic production was lost in a few days in 2017. Um, you know, there's a lot of pictures we can show you uh, this one from India, uh, this one from Kiribati. Um, and, the, and the questions emerge about why we should prioritize adaptation. As you know, mitigation is the reduction of the emissions of harmful greenhouse gases which are responsible for climate change. Early in the, in the sort of discovery of the effects of climate change in the 1950s through the 1970s and 80s, mitigation was really the entire focus of the debate. Um, and in, indeed, the question was, 
how do we stop climate change? As you also know, in the last couple of decades and accelerating in the last decade, increasingly the issue has become that of adaptation. That is accepting that climate change is happening anyway and figuring out what to do about it. We have to do something, right? And it unfortunately affects us all, but also unfortunately disproportionately affects the poorest people on the planet, making it much more difficult for many people uh, than for, for others. Um, as you know, mitigation is still far from resolved. That is, you know, an international agreement was reached a few years ago, the Paris Agreement. Uh, the United States withdrew from that agreement under President Trump and is now rejoining that agreement under President Biden. Um, but other important nations have also questioned the international system for dealing with climate change, which is known as the UNFCCC, the Framework uh, Convention on Climate. And so mitigation is not solved, but adaptation is increasingly recognized as part of the problem. And indeed, adaptation uh, appeals to people's ethical norms that you know we're only as good as the worst off. That is that we have moral obligations to participate and help in adaptation. And also we have a, an obligation to try and diminish suffering. But those are abstract reasons to conduct and actively invest in adaptation projects and programs, especially in the development area. There are practical reasons too, such as, as we have seen with COVID, uh, there are certain problems that are too big for individuals to handle or even countries. And if we don't all you know, address these scientifically validated and central problems to the future of uh, all of us, and if we don't address them collectively and swiftly and strongly, then we are not going to be able to uh, sufficiently safeguard the future of, um, of our grandchildren. So indeed, adaptation is something we should do, but it's also increasingly viewed as something we must do. Uh, there hasn't been a, a tremendous amount of finance internationally dedicated to adaptation. Overwhelming amounts of resources and, and frankly, an inadequate amount even in mitigation, but an overwhelming amount of the climate finance, that is resources given to try and fight climate change and to equip nation states and subnational entities to address climate um, have been in the mitigation space. The adaptation space has received very little funding, although there are some positive uh, notes to sound, which is that, for example, um, a study that I did with some others of World Bank uh, funding on adaptation shows a pretty dramatic increase there. And our speakers today are, are all going to speak about uh, the issues of the politics of adaptation and how it is that we can move adaptation forward using and trying to bring up some, some positive stories of how adaptation is underway as well as also being realistic about the needs and how extensive they are. Uh, so just to close this little segment by saying that indeed, as uh, the sort of ethicist Dale Jameson has written, these changes in climate are irreversible relative to almost any timescale of human interest. However, and I add that, it still matters what we do. Failures can be greater or lesser and we can live more or less successfully with the changes we are bringing about. So with, with that uh, effort to try to be less pessimistic and to focus on the road ahead, I would like to introduce our speakers. We are very fortunate today to have uh, Tamara uh, Kluger, uh, who is a senior associate in the World Resource Institute's Climate Resilience Practice. She helps to lead the Institute's work on locally led adaptation and other research programs focused on adaptation and resilience. And I am very pleased to introduce her and just to say that each of the presenters will be speaking uh, for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then please send us questions through the Q&A 
um, modality, which is available to most of you in Zoom. And um, we will try and at least leave a half an hour at the end for questions and answers. Uh, thank you very much and welcome uh, Tamara. Hi, Todd. Thank you so much. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, just going to get my presentation set up here. Um, great. I hope everyone can see. Um, so uh, like Todd said, my name is Tamara Kojer. I work at World Resources Institute in our climate resilience practice. Um, I'm also an AU alum, so it's great to be back on AU's uh, virtual campus. Um, and the past couple of years, I've been supporting the Global Commission on Adaptation. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about uh, the work that we've done through that commission and specifically focus on our work on locally led adaptation, which I think is particularly relevant both to the topics at hand of, of thinking about what comes next and, and what type of action we need to advance the adaptation agenda, but also um, particularly how we support the most vulnerable to climate change. Um, so the Global Commission on Adaptation, just as a bit of quick background, has been a three-year initiative um, essentially aimed at raising the profile of adaptation, kind of building on what Todd was saying that um, looking to, to enhance the global profile of adaptation compared with mitigation, recognizing that, um, that while we need to stop um, emissions and, and try to reduce the impact of climate change, we also are, are facing impacts and um, need to start adapting and coping with them. So um, the commission actually just sunsetted this past week at the Climate Adaptation Summit, um, but it was a group of more than 30 global leaders who kind of stepped up and to champion adaptation and um, to try to raise this issue as a priority on the global climate agenda. Um, our commissioners included these, uh, our three co-chairs who you see here on the screen. Um, and we put out a report in September 2019, ADAPT Now, that essentially laid out a set of recommendations for what needs to happen to accelerate adaptation globally. And, and those recommendations um, still stand. One of the kind of more notable findings I wanted to highlight that was featured in that report um, is related to the cost benefits of adaptation. So we found that um, that investing $1.8 trillion across these five sectors over the next 10 years um, would yield 7.1 trillion in benefits. So um, that's just one data point, but I think it speaks to the, the incredible economic and also social benefits of adaptation, that there are enormous um, returns on investing in adaptation. And, as we think about, you know, what comes next and how we inspire action on adaptation, it's useful to, to have this support you to know that that investing in adaptation pays off many times over. So over the past couple of years, the Global Commission on Adaptation has been working to advance um, these eight uh, thematic areas called our action tracks. And, you know, I could spend all day talking about all of them. Um, but I'm going to try to focus on um, our, our work on locally led adaptation, which is going to be a crucial part of the adaptation agenda moving forward as we think about building resilience and prioritizing those who are most directly impacted by the effects of climate change. Um, along the lines of the adaptation summit last week, Deborah actually put out a blog um, outlining the three shifts that are needed to advance adaptation moving forward. So, you know, this is not a comprehensive list, but, but highlighting some of the crucial areas um, that we need more finance, public and private, like Todd was saying, um, and we need this everywhere, especially for the most vulnerable countries. Um, we also need to integrate climate risk into policy and planning decisions, into budget decisions, and not to mention COVID relief packages. Um, and we also need to invest in, in locally led adaptation. So locally led adaptation is all about essentially confronting the current status quo of adaptation and setting a higher bar for adaptation that moves beyond participatory approaches um, to really ensuring agency 
by local actors. Um, you know, adaptation is inherently local, but the people, the communities who are at the front lines, who are there at the front lines of climate impacts, um, who have the firsthand knowledge of those impacts and the nuances behind those challenges and, and how we can, can start to solve them. These local actors rarely have a voice in the actions that most affect them. Adaptation finance is also not conducive to supporting local actors. It's not reaching the local level in the quantity that it needs to be, nor in the quality. So, you know, the quality of financing is not supporting local, um, locally led adaptation in terms of the complexity of the processes that, that it often takes for local actors to try to access funding um, in terms of, you know, the um, fiduciary requirements, small organizations are often not able to meet fiduciary standards or auditing reporting requirements. Um, and it makes it uh, seem more risky, essentially, to invest in local actors. Um, local institutions often struggle to find longer term or flexible funding um, that's needed to allow for the learning and the adjustment um, and the time that it takes to accommodate the dynamic and uncertain nature of climate change. Um, so locally led adaptation is essentially about ensuring that that these local actors have the power and the agency to make the decisions that affect their lives, affect their ability to cope with climate change, and that they have the resources to do so. So it's not about putting the burden on local communities to, to adapt, but really about making sure that they have the finance, they have the climate information, they have the institutional capacities um, to adapt. It's about subsidiarity, um, making sure that that decisions happen at the lowest appropriate level um, and investing in solutions um, that allow for the innovation and the flexibility and the um, local knowledge that local actors have to, to come through. So this is sort of a big um, systemic shift that we're talking about. Um, we're talking about upending a status quo and, and setting a new standard for adaptation. Um, so with this substantial shift, you know, where do we, where do we start? Especially when we're thinking about action and, and how do we actually, um, how do we actually get traction on this? Um, so to kind of start on that path of locally led adaptation at the Climate Adaptation Summit last week, 40 organizations endorsed these principles for locally led adaptation, which were um, developed by the organizations you see um, here on the on the screen um, and these principles essentially lay the foundation for what needs to change um, to ensure that local actors are, are at the center of adaptation efforts so these principles lay out you know i won't go through in, in super detail all of them but i'm happy to answer um, questions on them but we're talking about devolving decision-making to the lowest level. That's this idea of subsidiarity that I mentioned, about addressing structural inequalities, about providing long-term funding that is predictable so that local actors can rely on it and that it's accessible. We're talking about investing in institutional capacities, again, so that, so that we're not burdening, but, but sort of but really building that, that institutional legacy to lead adaptation about um, ensuring robust understanding of climate risk and uncertainty goes hand in hand with, with that building of a local capacity and legacy. Uh, flexible programming and learning, we know that adaptation is dynamic, it comes with lots of uncertainty, and so we need to be, um, we need to have adaptive approaches to adaptation. Um, ensuring transparency and accountability, mutual accountability, downward accountability to local actors rather than kind of the, the traditional um, top down that, we, that we're used to seeing. And collaboration, you know, while we're talking about working at the local level, this, this effort is going to involve actors across all levels and sectors and collaboration with humanitarian field and the development field and disaster risk reduction. Um, so making sure that we're, we're collaborating. 
So um, these organizations, here's sort of the, the snapshot of the 40 who have endorsed so far, and, and this is just the beginning, um, but have all kind of come together and acknowledge that this is a priority for adaptation moving forward, which is, um, which is a pretty significant thing, I would say. Um, and I think it's also significant, you'll notice that, you know, this list includes large international NGOs and donors, as well as grassroots organizations, um, which speaks to the fact that this is something that we all have a stake in um, and that we all have a role to play, you know, that varies depending um, across different types of institutions. But um, we all sort of rely on, on one another being resilient to climate change. Um, so a couple of sort of naughty issues that I also wanted to highlight um, as we're thinking about how we advance this agenda and, um, and support locally led adaptation moving forward. You know, we acknowledge that, that this takes time, that, that these are not small changes that we're talking about. And so we often refer to a journey of locally led adaptation um, and recognizing that there is a lot of learning and more um, evidence building to be done along the way. Um, we also note that, that just like adaptation itself is relevant everywhere, so is locally led adaptation. We have examples from, um, most of the examples that we often turn to um, are from the global south, but this is also relevant in the US and, and all over um, where we're seeing the importance of investing in local institutions um, and of supporting those who are on the front lines of climate change and who are most directly impacted by climate risk. Um, and also that adaptation needs to be intentionally equitable. So it's, you know, um, lo even local adaptation is not inherently equitable. We need to be proactive about addressing those structural inequalities in order for adaptation to truly be, be effective and equitable. Um, and so with that, you know, I just wanted to, to conclude, I'll say that, you know, this is, this is sort of the start of our journey. And so um, we'll be continuing this and, and certainly welcome other organizations who are interested in locally led adaptation to, to join us and to endorse um, these principles, which are, which again are, are the start of, and lay the foundation for, for future actions um, to come. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Todd. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And we appreciate your laying out the, the beginning of this journey and sort of giving us the perspective of the long view, which I, I think is, is really critical. And uh, WRI's work has been fascinating to follow and we look forward to continuing to see, to see how you adapt to these needs. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Asim Prakash of the University of Washington, where he is the Walker Family Professor for the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, his work is well known on issues of politics and climate change and climate adaptation, and he's the founding editor of the Cambridge University Press Series in Business and Public Policy, as well as uh, recently launching a uh, you know, Cambridge University Press Elements in Organizational Response to Climate Change, which uh, governments, businesses, and nonprofits. He also is the recipient in 2020 of the American Political Science Association's Eleanor Ostrom Career Achievement Award, recognizing uh, the achievements of uh, that social scientist. And uh, we really are very pleased to have him join us today to speak some about adaptation and some of the political aspects of it. So thank you very much, uh, Asim Prakash. Todd, could you please start my video? Excellent. So thank you, Todd, for inviting me to this panel. I'm going to talk about the politics of climate adaptation 
and it coheres very well with Tamara's uh, presentation that you just heard. What I'm going to offer is a political view. And by that, I mean, trying to understand not only why the dog barks, but why does the dog not bark? Or why does the dog bark on wrong occasions? And the key message I want to give is that politics is something we need to embrace. Politics is supposed to be a dirty word. And it's supposed to signal you know, nasty things that people do. But as a political scientist, I view politics as the GNA in our species. And to get most out of human interactions, of human behaviors, one has to understand politics instead of shunning it. So what I would present is some of the political issues that arise in the adaptation project and how we can anticipate those issues and hopefully take some corrective measures to ensure that our objectives are met. In spite of efforts of organizations like WRI, World Bank, Kanta, and Tamra, the fact is adaptation remains quite neglected in the climate discourse. So even on January 27, when President Biden spoke about the climate day, the term adaptation was barely mentioned. In fact, it appeared only once in his remarks and resilience twice. And this is when we've had an adaptation summit in the previous week. So the issue is, why the adaptation taboo? That we have been talking about adaptation for a while, and I'm surprised the extent to which it's greeted with skepticism. And one reason is that uh, there is a belief, right or wrong, that adaptation could crowd out mitigation because it's politically more attractive. And mitigation means, as Todd had underlined, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So the issue is why is adaptation politically more attractive? And the reasons are pretty simple, that adaptions by and large tends to create local excludable benefits versus the global non-excludable benefits produced by uh, mitigation. And if climate change is indeed a problem of collective action, especially of the global commons, and one reason people, activate communities, firms do not want to contribute to mitigation is because the benefits are non-excludable, adaptation does pretty well on that count because the benefits are local and they tend to be excludable. Moreover, the benefits are in short run, as opposed to 2050, 2100 or whatsoever. Here, the benefits can come in the next flood cycle, in the next hurricane or the next drought. And these are visible problems. So whenever problems are visible, it's easier to mobilize political coalition. There is, there's tons and tons of political science research shown that shows how problem visibility leads to political mobilization or facilitates political mobilization. And finally, we have the organizational infrastructure in place. We have the fire department, we have the disaster management uh, agencies, so on and so forth, which can be quickly activated to respond to extreme weather events. This, as I will subsequently suggest, is also a problem. So what does it crowd out? And does it actually crowd out mitigation? So Nevis Dolshak, uh, Brian Greenhill and I decided to test this out empirically. And we conducted a survey experiment uh, asking for support of a gasoline tax, which is a classic mitigation uh, strategy. And our intuition was that if we tell people about the adaptation costs, it might alter their perceptions or their support for mitigation. And the idea is that if people start recognizing that climate change actually has a cost, they may be willing to incur some other cost to prevent it. So we had a control group which uh, received no information on adaptation costs. And then we had various treatment groups that actually received information on different levels and types of adaptation costs. And our key finding is that there is a very, uh, that information on adaptation costs actually leads to a small increase in respondents' willingness to support mitigation efforts. So the bottom line is, and of course, this was an online survey done only in the United States with uh, obviously, you know, there are issues about generalizability but it's a good plausibility probe 
to start thinking that adaptation may not undermine mitigation. In fact, when people start writing checks, facing tax hikes, or paying other kinds of uh, payments, fees, levies, to construct adaptation infrastructure, they may actually become more sensitive about the need to mitigation and therefore more amenable to issues like gasoline tax or other measures that can help mitigation and lower uh, carbon emissions. I think as Tamara noted that we are seeing an increased focus, at least at the international level, uh, on adaptation. And there was an adaptation summit recently where it was very clear that it's now vocally and prominently recognized that although we should focus on mitigation, there is no doubt about that, we cannot ignore adaptation because climate change is already in motion. And its effect, as again Tamara and Todd noted, are disproportionately on the poor and the vulnerable sections of society. The challenge is how to construct the adaptation policy mix. Of course, that's a problem in mitigation as well. But adaptation is much more complex than mitigation because it's not focusing on reduction on, of a couple of gases. So one view could be what we call scientific rationality, that scientists could pinpoint locations that are most vulnerable to extreme weather events. And this is where the adaptation focus should be to protect, if it's possible, of course, with sea level rise, certain areas cannot be protected, but to protect these most vulnerable locations. And vulnerability could be physical vulnerability, it could be economic, socio, uh, uh, social institutional vulnerability. So one can define vulnerability in different ways. The second perspective is what we call economic rationality. That the issue is really not about vulnerability, it's really about costs and benefits. So if certain areas are very productive, they're rich agricultural land, and by investing in say adaptation infrastructure, we could you know maintain them as opposed to some other piece of land which is not rich in agricultural productivity, then economic rationality would suggest that invest in areas where the net benefits of the society are highest. And of course, you know, we can talk about social cost of carbon, we can see how we operationalize net benefits. But this is one way to think about where to or how to design the adaptation mix. The political rationality perspective, which uh, I outlined, suggests that it's actually fruitless to talk about optimal adaptation because adaptation is essentially, eventually a political choice. It is not negating scientific rationality or economic rationality. It can certainly draw on them, but eventually it's a political choice. It involves money and it is shaped by who gets what and why. That's the classic definition of politics uh, propounded by Laswell in his book, uh, this is what politics is, who gets what and why. So if you adopt this framework, we will be able to understand why adaptation policies sometimes succeed are accepted by local communities. And sometimes there is opposition. So I'm going to draw on a recent article that Nevis and I wrote in the Annual Review of Environment and Resources called The Politics of Climate Change Adaptation. It's available on my homepage. If you can't access it, please email me and I'll be happy to send you. I think Annual Review is also open access. So you could actually go to the website and download it. And in this article, we kind of map out what we call the adapt, climate adaption policy scape. And the political dimensions are who, what, and why. The who dimension is which actor is tasked with developing and implementing adaptation policies. There is no automatic candidate, there are many candidates. And should the existing disaster management organizations be tasked with providing adaptation or should new structures be created? And how will the resources be divided between local and national levels? An issue that Tamara had also brought about. The second dimension is what types of adaptation policies are provided? Who, who benefits? And there is a lot of debate on different types, reactive versus proactive adaptation, soft versus hard infrastructure. I'll talk about that in a second. Should it be provided by government? or there should be an active involvement of local communities, what we call the co-production model, Ellen Orstrom's. What about maladaptation? And I'll talk about that, adaptation spillovers 
and the equity, the asymmetric benefits and costs that are distributed in the process of creating an environmental adaptation, climate adaptation framework. And then you know, if we step back and we should ask ourselves, why are specific policies preferred? What's the logic? And one logic is visible versus less visible benefits. Visible benefits lead to political mobilization. So there is a tendency of policymakers of politicians to favor visible adaptation versus less visible adaptations. And how should we understand the role of international donors in adaptation processes? Are they helping adaptation processes to meet local needs or are they imposing the global goals on local perspectives? So the issue is who decides what adaptation policy should be adopted? And this is important, but one could also say, what's the big deal? Adaptation has been happening since time immemorial. There have been droughts, there have been floods, there have been natural calamities, and people always respond. There's population movement, uh, people change cropping patterns, they build river embankments. So is, are we making a fuss or are we merely upgrading what already has? is in place? Is adaptation simply the new wine in the old disaster management bottle? And this is when I talk especially with local governments and I've served on the Economic Development Council of, uh, of my city as well. This is the kind of feedback we get that we see, why are you making fuss about this? We already have fire department, disaster management plans, so on and so forth. So this is an important issue to think that what will be the organizational locus of adaptation? We can take a very narrow view and equate it with disaster management, or we can take a very expansive view and say, no, adaptation actually needs to be economy-wide because of climate change. We'll have to change crop patterns. There'll be urban heat islands, and we have to think on how to protect urban areas, especially communities of color and disadvantaged individuals. There'll be water flow problems, especially you know India, where I come from. There is a significant reduction in river flow because the glaciers are melting, and there will be massive population movement. The report that uh, Todd had reference is an excellent example that documents the massive population movement that could probably take place. So, how are we going to respond to this, and who will be responsible? Will there be a nodal body? There'll be a new ministry, a new department. Would there be a climate czar, the kind uh, President Biden has created in the US? Or would we kind of mobilize the same structures that we already have in place for climate mitigation? These are the issues that we have not adequately thought about. And these are complex issues because adaptation would involve budgets. And there'll be organizational politics which will be unleashed. Different departments will stake a claim that they should be the focal point uh, for adaptation. And this leads to internecine warfare. So it's not to say this cannot be handled. It can be handled in different ways. For example, United States created Homeland Security. Uh, President Biden has appointed a climate czar, at least for domestic policy. So there are different ways to tackle these problems. But before we tackle a problem, we first have to recognize it. And in the adaptation discourse, I don't see an adequate appreciation of the organizational dimension of adaptation politics. And then there is this perennial issue of local versus national. Most of the foreign aid tends to flow, not always, through the national government. So they control the purse strings. Of course, you know, donors can directly deal with local governments, especially when they go through NGOs but that creates a different problem altogether, especially in uh, failing states, it accentuates state failures because state's ability to deliver public good gets undermined. And what if local and national priorities differ? National government has a particular view of climate adaptation, but local authorities have a different view. And it's not only the political uh, difference, what if this local and national map into ethnic, religious, or linguistic divisions. That means the local area 
is populated by a different community and the national government is led by a different community. So what started off as a division of resources for climate adaptation can quickly spiral into a religious, linguistic or ethnic conflict. So let me give you an example of the farmers' protests in India. I'm sure all of you have read about it. Nevis and I have written about it as well. These are the two articles we have published. So one of the important motivations for these farmers, uh, the new farm laws, is to wean the farmers away from rice. Punjab, Haryana, Northwestern Uttar Pradesh, which is called the Green Belt of India, started growing rice after the Green Revolution. And much of the rice is grown because uh, by, by irrigation. So we have extensive systems of canals, we have tube wells and so on and so forth. And there is an overuse, a systematic overuse of water, which is leading to a declining water table. This has become a very, very serious issue in the state of Punjab. Of course, there have been certain you know, uh, measures how to correct this, but the government would like to change the cropping pattern. And one way it is trying to do is through the new farm laws. Farm laws have their own problems and I can talk about that during the Q and A's. But the problem is, the political problem is, this is translating into a religious divide because the section of farmers that are subjected to the new laws tend to belong to the Sikh faith. And there has been a history of, you know, of violence, of terrorism in that area. In fact, this was an important reason why the, the burning of rice stubble that takes place in November, October, November in India has not been acted upon because the farmers insist that they will burn because this is the most economical way to do. And the federal government, which in India we call the central government is not willing to crack down. So if we put this in the adaptation perspective, if you want to conserve water table, if you want to make sure that cropping pattern has to change, we'll have to create new institutions. But these new institutions created by the federal government map into linguistic, ethnic fractionalization. So it becomes extremely messy. What types of adaptation policies are provided? So let me just talk about one specific dimension that often comes up is soft versus hard adaptation. Soft adaptation means any social, economic structures, institutions, relationships that can allow the hard infrastructure to function. So in terms of analogy, one could say that we can have trains and tracks, but we need the soft infrastructure to make sure that the trains run on time. Viewed this way, adaptation has a very important sociological and political dimension. It's a social process and it involves co-production with the households. I think COVID and pandemics where household input cooperation is very necessary is an example that if climate change were to trigger a pandemic that would require co-production with local households, it could create different kinds of political dynamics. That's why it's important to have soft, soft infrastructure in place, trust in government, trust in neighbors, what we call social capital, to make sure that the policies get carried out voluntarily. So we kind of mapped out the challenges in creating a soft adaptation infrastructure. One is that it's a very slippery term. It has multiple dimensions. In fact, anything, everything concerned with economic development equity can be subsumed under soft infrastructure. And there are different interest groups favoring different dimensions. So the issue is whose preferences would prevail. Second, if social capital is enhanced by social cohesion, then this could clearly and very quickly create an in-group versus out-group problem, which at least in some countries becomes very serious because the local level is not homogeneous, it's pretty heterogeneous with a lot of power asymmetries. And of course, you know, when it requires co-production with citizens involving NGOs, NGOs themselves are under tremendous attack. And in many countries, NGOs are viewed with suspicion, especially if they are funded by foreign donors. So creating a soft adaptation infrastructure sounds very nice, but it is extremely complex because it is vague and it is amenable to different kinds of pulls and pressures. Then of course, you know, good intentions can go bad or we can't anticipate the spillovers, the unanticipated consequences of our actions. And this happens in maladaptation where the efforts to adapt in place A at period T leads to some externalities. 
either in different jurisdiction in the same time period or the same jurisdiction over time. So sprinklers that one might install because of rising temperatures could lower water table for everybody. It's a common pool resources problem. Or river embankment which are constructed to enhance social resilience to flooding can redirect flood waters elsewhere. Then of course, you know, we have this political problem of voters rewarding visible policies like disaster relief, as opposed to less visible proactive policies like enhancing disaster preparedness. So if you really want to in invest in disaster preparedness, then you need a very good uh, rationale and political communication to convince people that it is worth their while to invest in this particular kind of infrastructure. And then of course, is the issue of adaptation reporting. The standardized reporting formats, which are necessary at times, create different kinds of issues because they incentivize policymakers to focus on the reported issues, what we call the problem of commensuration to the neglect of other issues. So viewed this way, international donors exercise sizable influence on what adaptation policies get highlighted and what don't. Uh, the main point is we have to bring politics back in. Adaptation on the face of it was supposed to pose fewer policy challenges, fewer collective action problems, because it was local, it was excludable. But as I've tried to make the point that adaptation is extremely complex and it will unleash political and distributional conflicts. It impacts how we think about federalism uh, and how we think about bureaucratic politics. And soft infrastructure, while it's very important, I am not disputing the importance of soft infrastructure, is very vague. And that would lead to interest group capture or the adaptation policy framework. And finally, although international aid will drive local priorities because adaptation is so expensive, there is a need to be able to identify a couple of adaptation targets. Mitigation was kind of lucky because we have something like a zero emission by 2050, but absence of targets, which are almost impossible in adaptation, we will have a very diffuse dispersed adaptation response, which will be difficult to assess and which will be uh, difficult to kind of carry forward and scale up if that need is so required. So finally, you know, we are often told, listen to science, and I think we should listen to science. But the reality is adaptation is not a laboratory experiment. It involves people, people with preferences, people with historical experiences, people embedded in different relationships and institutions. So it's taking place in the real world. And the real world, which is already struggling with a lot of problems of poverty, of inequality, of populism, and so on and so forth. So what a political perspective would do is it would kind of challenge the technocratic perspective on adaptation. And it would allow us to identify actors and institutions that might be involved in the adaptation policy framework. And it would help us anticipate opposition, identify constraints, and therefore allow us to exploit opportunities to improve resilience of our social systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so in our first speaker, uh, Tamara emphasized institutions and the creation of new ways of trying to think about adaptation and addressing it, especially at the, at the subnational level. And now our second speaker, uh, we, we owe him gratitude for opening back up the idea that politics is at the center of this. Uh, and in fact, We've spent a good deal of time in the US just getting science back to the center of things for the last four years. And now, indeed, we have to get politics into the center of adaptation. So we thank Asim for, for bringing those distributional issues up. Now we're going to turn to Kanta Kumari Rigaud, who is a lead environmental specialist and regional climate change coordinator in the Africa region of the World Bank Group. She's a leading expert on climate adaptation and resilience. She works on climate policy strategy and knowledge management. And she has led uh, 
the work on some of the groundbreaking publications of the World Bank, such as Groundswell, which many of us have read and cited as a leading source of information on the possible uh, inequality and uh, strong adverse um, results of climate change over the years ahead and climate migration in particular. So she, I think, is going to address in particular some of the difficult issues facing one of the hardest hit regions of the world. And so without any further introduction, I'll present um, Dr. Kumari. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's great to be here and uh, even better to follow, I think, two great presentations. I can see that uh, we'll have a great discussion. But I wanted to focus, as Todd highlighted, um, on, on maybe some of the very practical challenges uh, and responses that we've taken in the context of Africa's development challenges. Uh, so what I thought we could do, I would do is maybe share with you three stories from the field, which I think bring to the surface the kind of approaches that Tamara talked about, as well as some of the issues the challenges that uh, Asim referred to. But let me start here with um, the pastoralists, the pastoralists in, in the Sahel. These are people who are very much, their livelihood is linked with seasonality. And what we mean here is that these are the farmers who live in the arid and semi-arid areas in the Sahel, where livestock farming is, is probably the best kind of livelihood option they have. And for as a tradition, you know, they have been the ones who've been moving as a consequence uh, of seasonality changes whenever water and pastures become scarce based on the annual seasonal cycle, they would move to other areas where they would be able to get the kind of resources they need for the livestock and for themselves. Needless to say, these 20 million livestock uh, pastoralists who live in the Sahel uh, have been now challenged. They've been challenged by climate change. Uh, and we know that because climate change is really changing the whole way that seasonality works. We have the onset of the rainy season later or earlier and, and nothing is quite so predictable as we had in the old almanacs, which really means that they have to move before, once the rains don't come, they have to move. And as a consequence, when they do move, they move into areas where the farmers who are sedentary have not really harvested their crop. And this then can, you know, creates a certain kind of a conflict, uh, not to say that population growth and other issues don't add to the numbers and the scale of the issue. So while we have the Sahel pastoralists, who were the original climate adapters, uh, who've always sort of adapted to climate change, the way that climate patterns are changing now is already challenging them and will continue, we know, to challenge them because we are trapped into a level of warming that is going to continue to increase not just the climate change trends, but the climate variability and climate extremes. So one of the things that uh, we've worked in the, in the context of the Sahel, and this covers uh, uh, six countries uh, stretching from Senegal, Mauritania, Mali, Burkina, Niger, and Chad, uh, where we have this arid and semi-arid lands, um, and the pastoralists of, obviously traditionally would take their livestock and move around, and not just within their countries, but across borders, and that they seem to work pretty well. But all of this has been challenged. So what the Regional Sahel Pastoralism Project try to do is work on some of these opportunities and challenges. And this is a cohesive project to Asim's point. It's not just an adaptation project and separate from a development. It's an integrated approach to bring those issues together, recognizing that some of those challenges are climate and weather induced. So we have a, a program that uh, works across uh, three, four important issues. The first is really trying to improve that natural resource management, really working with the, with, with the herders and the, the pastoralists to make sure that the way they look at, they manage those resources is done in a more sustainable way to include in the, the movement, the transhumance corridors. But at the same time, it's also about reducing the kind of conflicts that occur when mobility patterns change and the clash occurs between the sedentary and, and the mobile pastoralists. 
And here I think is the point that uh, Tamara was making that one major area of work has to be this climate informed way of doing things. So what the program is doing is using early warning systems uh, to understand when there may be certain onsets and to also use satellite data to understand where the water resources would be and try to guide the movement using cell phone technology and others. So there's multiple things uh, at play here, but you really have a platform for early warning system uh, that allows the mobility to happen in a more um, conducive way, as well as to create less crisis and conflicts. Uh, and then the, I wouldn't go into the rest, there is the mar facilitating market access because it's really about you know, trading, uh, not just the cattle, but the milk and the meat, and all of that is really important and, and institutional strengthening. So I think the point here is that you have a particular uh, community type that is particularly exposed and, there, and climate is that sort of multiplier challenge that interfaces with the right rest of the issues that they have and how do we bring in the climate issues in a more systematic way to address it. With that, let me move to a second example uh, where in the first case, we are talking about long-term climate patterns and trends that are really playing out in the Sahel that cause um, a challenge. Here we're talking about in Uganda, in Northern Uganda, and Uganda is, is uh, you know, in the Northern where it's really the poorest uh, of the communities live in Karamoja and others. They are particularly exposed to extreme events um, and including droughts as well. And, uh, We've had a Northern Uganda Social Action Fund project uh, for the communities here for, for the last couple of, uh, at least more than 10 or 15 years. Uh, and that really has been trying to uh, empower the communities and provide social grants. And I think, uh, you know, to, to, I think back to Tamara's point on this locally led aspects, um, I was surprised to see that the bank wasn't as a partner. I know we're doing some work on, on the locally led side of it, um, uh, but we can catch up about that. But I think there's been a much more inclusive approach to, to have responsive ways of dealing with the communities. But one of them is really building their resilience against natural disasters. And what we had here is the third phase of this Northern Uganda Social Action Fund project. And what we did here was to bring in a couple of new elements. So while this is a $130 million program, uh, there was a $12 million design into it uh, called the Disaster Risk Financing Innovations. And this really was in two parts. The first was creating a way in which we were able to detect uh, the drought, for example, through an early warning system. And here it was a system of using vegetation index coupled with satellite data to have an early indication that drought was going to be a, a more widespread phenomenon. And through that, there was a link to an insurance mechanism which would be triggered uh, to provide a, a payout to the government. And that was then linked with uh, providing labor intensive public works to the community so that they would not be displaced or not have to sort of move out or go into a situation of food crisis. So this is really bringing together multiple uh, prongs of work uh, from the science that we heard about that is really important uh, from the timeliness of getting this information into a form and then really linking with uh, a financing mechanism that works. And uh, what happened in, in 2016, uh, compared to the two uh, earlier El Ninos in 2010 and 2011, which caused quite a lot of devastation in this area, the 2016 um, El Nino uh, really did reduce the number of people who were impacted by this. At least 30,000 households, which is close to 150,000 people, were able to sort of sustain themselves and to adapt and cope uh, through this crisis uh, in a way that I think uh, was compared to other areas that didn't have such uh, mechanisms were really exposed to. So I think this is really a, a project that shows about the vulnerabilities and how we can use uh, climate informed systems uh, to avert it, but mu must be linked with other sequential uh, uh, arrangements in place. The third example I'd like to touch on, and then we'll come back to sort of the big messaging is on Ethiopia. We all know that this is a country that has suffered a lot in terms of land degradation, food insecurity, and the government has been really, you know, very proactive in addressing these issues 
uh, moving from, from retail to scale. And you have here a snapshot on the left and right uh, of the same geographic area where through a very persistent and, and continued engagement on sustainable land management, uh, there's really been this pursuance of resilience at scale. And what happened here was, I think, there was a recognition that you have this highlands that are very degraded, affect food security, and uh, the bank together with other partners and, and the government had a sustainable land management framework, which was really engaging communities uh, to restore these areas as the resilience of the landscape itself would nurture the resilience to the people and to their livelihoods and, and to food security. And we've had three generations of these sustainable land management programs that have benefited close to two, more than 2 million beneficiaries. And then it got scaled up to what we call a program for results, where we then worked on the land tenure system uh, to secure that for the communities. Um, and the results, I think, uh, you know, speak for themselves. But right now, I think what is important is that building off these sort of smaller operations that got enlarged and sustained over time, there is now a push to bring about the kind of policy reforms uh, that can really bring the benefits to scale in, in much larger ways. And we've sort of bundled the resilience with the opportunities to, to, to also bring in the low carbon aspects in terms of the carbon sequestration from landscapes, but also possibly other reforms. This is work that is still uh, under development, but to show you how one moves, if one can, uh, sequentially to, to, to reform actions at scale. All of this to say that I think, you know, in the African context, there is no doubt that the poor in Africa and the economies in Africa are disproportionately impacted by climate change. And, and what we've done in the next generation Africa climate business plan, which we launched in September, and it built off the first plan, which was very successful. But at the same time, we can't claim success when the situation in the countries is dire in terms of the nature of climate impacts. And we took a very development centered approach to looking at squarely what are those issues that, that are most at play. And I think in terms of, you know, a point that Asim made, good to come back to discussion, adaptation targets. I think what we've kept in mind is how do we meet those sustainable development goals? Because without the right adaptation and even to some extent the mitigation policies, we wouldn't meet that. So in terms of you know, food security, we know that in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have 250 million people today who are extremely food insecure. When you add that to moderate, it goes up to 600 million of the 1 billion people. So food security and the way that climate is acting on it from an end-to-end -end fashion, not just on the farm, the distribution system and the marketing of it. So we're looking at putting that climate lens to that end-to-end. We also know that environmental stability, as we showed in the, in the Ethiopia example, is critical, is foundational, not just for the resilience of the community, but in some ways, these ecosystems, they are where 60 to 80 percent of, of Africans live, and they do contribute to the economy, but that has not been uh, reflected in the national economies, and we need to reflect that, but environmentally too, they are the first line of defense. I won't go through the rest and clean energy. I want to underscore here. Half the people in Sub-Saharan Africa do not have access to energy. And we see energy in two ways. One is how do we get energy access first and for all, for most. And secondly, how do we get access to energy that is green and renewable to reduce the carbon footprint as, as a contribution to the global community. But energy access itself is you know, a critical pillar of resilience. It allows you have, you know, schools that will be powered, hospitals that will be powered and job opportunities that will uh, increase. Climate shocks we know we will deal with in Africa for the foreseeable future. The, the intensity and frequency of these will increase and we must create that level of preparedness at scale that we talked about in Uganda. Last of all, I think uh, Africa is on an urban transition, 40% urban today, 60% by 2050, but a tripling of the number of people there from 400 million to 1.2 billion. All of this to say that we can't achieve all of these securities without climate and climate adaptation and mitigation are at play. So in the context of the plan, I think we can, we really believe that adaptation continues to be the cornerstone of the next generation business plan. 
but we equally think that you know while the first plan only focus on adaptation we do think that there are critical opportunities for africa to harness the clean and green energy they do need assistance they need technology they need financing and they need uh, partnerships uh, but needless to say it will be good both for africa and the world if africa moves into those null development pathways so let me stop there. Uh, but the last point I wanted to make, while we're talking about climate change here in a conversation with Ted, uh, in the plan, we really sort of make the point that these trends on climate and, and the projections are not happening in isolation. Africa by 2050 will have a doubling from 1 billion to 2, 2 billion. So you have a demographic. We talked about the urbanization uh, transition underway. We hope that technological innovations, which are also increasing at scale, can help us. And how do we harness those? Uh, but at the same time, recognizing that other big mega trends uh, could also be a challenge. So I think it's looking at climate, climate adaptation and mitigation, but against a backdrop of these mega trends, which really makes the, the challenge uh, seem so big. But at the same time, really, we are hopeful if we can all work together. And I think getting all the countries on board on both of these agendas is really important. Thank you very much uh, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much uh, for speaking with us about how to make and bring adaptation to the forefront of mainstream development projects, but in tandem with a holistic view that also includes some of the other issues that you mentioned. And I guess we're going to open it up for questions. As the moderator, I, I think I want to just ask one to start, which is perhaps for all of the panelists, and it would be about how you know the UN Sustainable Development Goals have a few mentions of, of climate and I believe adaptation, but it would seem that over the years ahead that in the development area that adaptation will become an increasing priority. And as Asim mentioned the need for targets, which is very important, and the two speakers from uh, international and um, national organizations um, would probably also agree with the importance of targets that are very specific. Nonetheless, for adaptation, we still don't have a concrete way of, of measuring it as we do for mitigation, which is just, you know, the amount of emissions. Uh, so how do we how do we start to move towards a more specific way of targeting, measuring uh, adaptation and holding actors responsible for adaptation? Um, so I, I, I'd like to collect a few more questions before we we get uh, your answers, but I would also like, yes, thank you, everyone, please appear. And let me just gather a few more questions. And if you have them, please bring them to the Q&A area. We have a statement about uh, projects in the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center. Uh, and the mandate of adaptation for CARICOM, I guess, I guess the question is enactment of that mandate, um, how, how to do that. Um, I think a more specific question also is posted in the, in the Q&A, which is about how it is that uh, politicians such as President Biden may be hesitant to publicly discuss adaptation because they worry that it could be taken as a signal that we've passed the point of no return on mitigation, I think that's also that's that's a good question. Um, so I guess with those questions, please um, we'll we'll take a round of responses. And also, panelists, if you want to respond to the other speakers, please feel free to do so. Why don't we go in the order, uh, the original order, and uh, and then while we do that, others can add some more questions. So please, uh, Tamara. Um, yeah, so this, I mean, this question on, on measuring adaptation and targets is, I think as, as most of us are familiar with, it's a really tricky one and a naughty subject, but it also, it is really important. And, and like Asim was saying, it's one of the things that um, I think it, it makes it harder. You know, it's easy to track mitigation. Uh, we can count emissions um, reduced and, and we can feel, you know, we can gauge where we are um, 
uh, towards that goal, but, but with adaptation, it's so complex. It involves so many different sectors. Um, there are lots of things that we could be looking at. And it's going to what what matters um, in terms of resilience and what we define as sort of success. Have we adapted? Are we resilient? That also varies from place to place. Um, and so I think that's an important thing to, to think about. I, you know, I don't have an, <laughs> an easy answer for sort of a global goal or a target, but um, along the lines of, you know, of this idea of, of heterogeneity of um, resilience interests and uh, definitions of what resilience means. Um, I think that that's important to, to take into account. Um, one of the things that we've been thinking about as part of our locally led adaptation work is that, and that part of ensuring that the local actors have agency and um, are part of those decision-making processes is that they're also um, part of, they also have that agency in terms of deciding how we measure adaptation so that, you know, targets aren't imposed on them that, that maybe they don't care about or agree with as, as sort of what matters for, for resilience, um, but, but that they have a say in, in owning what, um, what resilience looks like. And that's sort of this newer idea of, of subjective um, definitions of resilience. Lindy Jones um, has written a lot on this topic, and I, I think it's sort of a, a, budding, a budding topic that is worth a lot more um, examination as we think about how we measure resilience. Um, I guess quickly on the other point that was raised on sort of how we frame adaptation and is it, you know, sort of seen as giving up um, or have we already, you know, kind of does it mean by adapting, does it mean that that we kind of have lost any chance at, at mitigating? I think um, I just wanted to highlight one of the, the messages that came through at the adaptation summit last week, it sort of was reiterated, um, was this idea that, that it adaptation you know, adapting doesn't mean we're giving up. It's it's about facing reality, and and those two are are distinct. Um, you know that that that's what we're doing. We're facing reality. We're preparing for for sort of inevitable impacts of climate change, um, and and that by no means um, it implies that we're giving up. You're on mute, Todd. We can't. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm unable to unmute. Okay. Well, I can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And Asim, please. Yeah. Thank you. First, uh, I want to thank Tamara and Kanta for their excellent presentations. And I think it's important to tell positive stories. The too many negative stories and the picture Tam uh, Kanta showed of Ethiopia before and after. So sometimes pictures convey so much that the words can't. And you know they become the proof of concept that things can actually work in spite of all the chaos that's taking place in the world. There is still an opportunity for positive action. And I think as scholars and informed policymakers, it's important that we put out positive stories because there's so much of negativism and helplessness. Let me echo Tamara's point that we, we can't shy away from adaptation. It's still a taboo word and people kind of approach it very gingerly. And one of the problems is the mitigation rhetoric is so shrill. It's reduced by 2050 or die, you know, that kind of things, this kind of absolutism. And I can understand, you know, in terms of political communication, you have to have clear message. If you start talking about conference intervals, then the climate skeptics will jump on you and say, you're not 100% sure, right? So all those things. So I, I understand that. But the negative consequences is that the moment you give an inch to adaptation, you start undermining your case. And what I would suggest is kind of learn from Biden. I was really impressed by the build back better strategy. He turned climate change into an opportunity, not as a, not as a threat. So climate adaptation, and I think I am kind of... Uh, borrowing Kanta's idea, we don't have to say that protect yourself, protect yourself. You should, it's a great opportunity that climate adaptation and all these measures can be kind of bundled into development. It can 
increase your quality of life. It can increase equity. It can empower women. So we have to change the messaging from defensive to an opportunity messaging. And viewed that way, I think the conflict between adaptation and mitigation will be reduced. Of course, you know there'll always be some conflict because it's a division of pie. But I do think a different perspective. Adaptation is development. So we should stop talking about resilience and saving ourselves. You know, adaptation is an opportunity. The way mitigation is now being portrayed as an opportunity, new jobs, new this, new that. So I think it could be useful. And this is something we could actually test uh, in terms of political communication that does this have more traction? Does it increase the support for adaptation? The second is in response to the comment you had raised that on one hand, adaptation is multifaceted. On the other hand, you know, many of us say that, can you measure? Can you have some identifiable targets? And I, I appreciate the point you're making, there's a tension. And also when you start measuring a few things, there is what sociologists call the commensuration problem, that everything gets focused on those metrics because people, organizations, units want to look good. So they start focusing on those things. Nevertheless, I think we can find some common issues across countries, like availability of drinking water, X, Y, or Z. Uh, Notre Dame University has ND gains index for urban areas. It's only one cross section, but I think it's an excellent start and one could build on that. And similarly, one could have multiple indices. One can have an index at the national level and one can start having indices in different eco regions because adaptation uh, targets in some ways are eco region specific. What is important for Thar Desert in India is not important for Chirapunji. In, in northeastern India, which is you know having record rainfall. So I think if we start thinking creatively, uh, there's an opportunity to have measurable targets that would allow for political mobilization and mass mobilization. Thanks. Thank you very much. Kanta? Thank you, thank you everybody. Um, let me quickly uh, respond to a few points uh, that, that have been raised. On the first one, uh, Todd, very quickly to your point about targets. Um, I think the best place probably to, to sort of take the targets conversation is countries in their own updated NDC submissions are putting forward their targets. And I think this is really a good starting point. A lot of them have very concrete targets in terms of the mitigation side, which as we all know is easier to measure, but they also have really some very concrete ways in which they see the resilience and adaptation agenda being so crucial to the economy. So from the bank's perspective, I think we, we want to pay a lot more attention to this updated NDC target, NDC submissions, only seven till date, but I think by December, the numbers will go up very quickly. In terms of the SDGs, it doesn't deter us. While there's one reference to climate, if you think about agriculture, health, water, uh, whatever it is, they, they all need some kind of, of climate consideration. So that's on the target side. Um, you know, I, I think there's this question about this adaptation versus mitigation. And I think, you know, really it's not a binary choice. One is getting us deeper in the hole and we don't want to get deeper in the hole. The second is really giving us more strategies to get out of the hole. And we really have to work on both of them in tandem. And I think that really has to be the way one looks at it. There was a question that I really want to take up in the chat about education. I think that is a very important aspect. There was some work done by IAEA, I believe, in the Caribbean, which showed very clearly through the data that education is extremely important in getting people out of responses to, to crisis, disasters, for example. That was what they were looking at. And they found that even if people had informal education where women were exposed and trained and uh, made aware, their chances of, of, of sort of responding to the crisis was improved. If people had elementary education, it was even better. And of course, if you go higher, it's even better. So the, the importance of education and, and, and involving women, and there was also the sort of positive impact if women were the ones who were educated and exposed, needless to say. The last point is on the point of no return. I'm hogging it, but I just, uh, you know, this is a point that I really want to talk because it relates a lot to the sort of migration conversation. And in the groundswell report that Todd referred to, I think we talked when we looked at the three regions of Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America, 
we came up with a big number of 143 million people could be on the move. But we didn't say will be, it could be. And when we looked at two alternate scenarios, and as you go to a more climate friendly scenario, you could reduce those number by 80%. And really there are three things we need to do. There are lots that we can do about adapt in place. This is really bringing the development and adaptation so that people don't move as a first resort, but because they have more options. The second is recognizing where they have to move because the situation, particularly coastal areas, coastal islands, then how do you facilitate it with a kind of sort of dignity and locally led uh, inclusion to, to solutions uh, so that you know you, you do that. And the third is when people have already moved, how do you make sure there's a cohesion between the host and the migrant communities uh, so that you don't have tensions and conflicts? And I don't think we should shy away from that. This will be a reality, but it doesn't have to be as bad a crisis if we do certain things right now and a pitch that we will put out our second groundswell report before June, which will cover the regions we didn't. And, and I think are reaffirming some of our messages from before. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to express thanks on behalf of the Center for Environmental Policy of the School of Public Affairs of American University. Uh, I thank Kanta for catching some of the, the questions in the, in the q and I, I, I'm afraid we're not gonna have time to to go further into that, if, if one of the panelists wishes to have a last word, um, we can do that. I, we're a little bit over time. I think if, if not, I will just reiterate my thanks to all of the panelists for helping us unpack this concept of adaptation and try and help make it more accessible in our day-to-day -day considerations of climate change and development. And to ask you to uh, stay tuned, we'll be having more webinars on climate change issues uh, as we move forward in this academic year and, and well into the future. And again, just to thank everybody who joined us and uh, express gratitude to our, our presenters who really did a great job. Thanks again. Have a good day and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.